So, so first of all, I would like to, to thank the organizers for inviting me at, at my home to give this, uh, this talk. Uh, in fact, I've been assigned a quite precise uh, assignment, namely to give a historical view of the decomposition theorem in the simplest case, in the case of uh, a smooth uh, compact manifolds. So, I mean, this talk will be quite elementary. I, I apologize for those who, who know already of this. Uh, first part will be historical, if it was what I know of the history of the problem. And in the second part, I will explain uh, very roughly a sketch of proof following uh, Yahweh's theorem. So let me start uh, maybe with a statement of the theorem. Uh, here it is. Uh, so we start with a compact Keller manifold with a trivial uh, first chain class in, uh, in cohomology. Then uh, to a finite et al covering, this manifold M or M prime is a product of three types of uh, very specific manifolds. So T here is a complex torus. The second type, the Xi, which I will simply denote by X, are simply connected, projective manifold of a dimension at least three. And they have basically no holomorphic forms, except of course in, uh, the constant in degree zero, and one form of, uh, of maximal degree, which is the generator of the canonical bundle Kx. These are usually called calabi yaon manifolds, though the terminology is not uh, completely fixed. And the third type, the yj, which appear, uh, are also compact, simply connected Keller. And the algebra of holomorphic forms is a polynomial algebra in one two form, sigma, which is everywhere non degenerate in other terms. It's a, a simple form, and all the forms that we have on, uh, on Y are just the powers of, the, of this form. And these are called uh, irreducible symplectic manifolds, or for reasons we will see later, also hypercalar manifolds. So this is a nice structure theorem. It's like that, uh, up to uh, finite detail cover, we have a was a precise description of the manifolds which can appear. For uh, describing the history of the problem, let me uh, split the theorem in, uh, in two parts. The first part will be just, so we start from again from, with the same hypothesis. So we have a compact Keller manifold with C10 and we have a weaker conclusion, which is that up to, a, again, up to a finite et al cover, uh, M is a product of a complex torus, T, and a simply connected compact manifold, X, with trivial canonical bundle. So I, the difference is I don't ask for a, a decomposition of X, just a simply connected with trivial canonical bundle. Not that uh, this has already very uh, deep consequences. Uh, one is that the canonical bundle is torsion, uh, multiple of the uh, power of the canonical bundle is trivial uh, because clearly uh, T times X, uh, or T times X canonical bundle is trivial and that implies this uh, torsion property. The second property is that the fundamental group of M by one is virtually a billion, which means that it contains a finite index subgroup, which is a billion, namely as is given by this covering. Okay, this is the first part. The second part, which we call theorem B, uh, deals with the remaining case with this X that we have here, which is simply connected with trivial canonical bundle. So let's take a manifold with these properties and we have a further splitting. 
between uh, Calabi-Yarrow and uh, simplectic holomorphic. Irreducible as in the theorem. So uh, we can say that there are two different theorems. For explaining the history, it's uh, important to uh, come, uh, separate the two, two statements. So let me start the uh, history of this uh, of the problem. I think it comes with a Calabi conjecture. So this is uh, it's not uh, exactly 1954 at the International Congress in uh, Amsterdam. Calabi announced his conjecture, which is then now famous. In fact, his announces at the uh, theorem. It's a very short announcement. It's half page. Uh, so I will not uh, describe the Calabi conjecture in, uh, in general. It's a little bit uh, complicated. But uh, in our case, the case of interest for us, we have varieties with uh, where the first chain class is uh, trivial in uh, real cohomology. And the conclusion in that case is that N admits a Keller metric with a special, uh, I mean, a special metric with, uh, which is Ricci flat, meaning that the uh, Ricci curvature is zero. Now, uh, I will explain later just take this as a black box. If you don't know what is a Ricci curvature, I will explain later what it, uh, what it means. Uh, so pretty soon, I guess, Calabi realized that his proof was not complete. And in a paper of uh, 1957 or more, with more development, a longer paper, he restates now this as a conjecture, giving some, you know, evidence or some argument in favor of the conjecture. And the main application that it gives is a weak version of the theorem A that we had before, which I will call this theorem A prime. Uh, assume that M, well, the proposition which is proved is that if M admits a Ricci flat Keller metric, then we have a finite cover of M, a finite et al, by a product of a complex torus and a variety, a manifold, a compact manifold, with no holomorphic one forms. This is, of course, weaker. So if we prefer this is equivalent to B1, zero, first bt number uh, zero. This is weaker than uh, asking for simply connected, but uh, this is already highly non trivial OK, so uh, in particular, if we, if we accept uh, if Calibi's conjecture hold, we have this uh, uh, decomposition for any uh, Keller manifold with trivial first chunk class. In fact, uh, for projective manifold, the result was proved unconditionally by uh, Matsushima in 1969, so sometimes quite some time afterwards. Uh, theorem A prime holds for a projective manifold with uh, Trivial uh, third chain classes rest on a study of this uh, of the automorphism group of uh, of M. Then we arrive to uh, 1974 with the work of uh, Bogomolov. Um, uh, rather, two papers which appear in uh, 74 with almost the same uh, title. Uh, here, maybe I should uh, make a disclaimer. I mean. Uh, I admire very much uh, Fedya Bogomolov. I think he's, he's a great mathematician. He's also a very nice person. Uh, uh, he's not always uh, extremely careful. And, and in this case, I mean, in, in this uh, subject, yes, but a few errors, which I, I will have to, to explain. So uh, what does he do in these uh, two papers? In the first one, uh, he proves, first of all, uh, theorem A prime in the projective case. Uh, there are a number of other results which are not so much interesting for me. Uh, I want also to mention that he proved, in the killer case, he, well, he proves uh, more or less the fact that the uh, canonical bundle is a uh, distortion. This is more or less because this rests on a, on a lemma which is not proven and which is not at all clear for me, but maybe this is just that uh, I don't understand well what, what he is doing. Anyway, most, more interesting is uh, part two, 
And in, in, uh, in the second paper, he announces uh, theorem B in a slightly weaker form. If we have a simply connected Keller compact manifold with trivial canonical bundle, then it is a product of a variety X and yj, a product of some yj. The yj are symplectic manifolds. They have a two form uh, which is everywhere non-degenerate. Uh, and m with, for m with, for x, sorry, uh, we know only that it has no holomorphic two forms. Another space. So it's a kind of uh, the composition which appears in theorem B or in, in the theorem only as a level of two forms, but that's already quite uh, I mean, that really is a, a decomposition. Uh, the problem is that the proof is not, uh, in my view, the proof is, uh, is not complete. Uh, what he does, he reduces, and that's not too hard, to the following statement. So now you have M simply connected with trivial canonical bundle. You assume that TM decomposes as a direct sum of two integrable subbundles. Integrable meaning uh, stable under the uh, Lie bracket. And moreover, uh, they have trivial determinants. Then he claims that this implies that M is a product, uh, X times Y, with uh, the factor, the summand E corresponding to X and F corresponding to Y. Uh, okay, that, that's a very, if you, if you forget about the condition and determinant, I think this is still, I mean, to my knowledge, this is still an open problem, which is quite interesting. I mean, if you have a, a variety, a decomposition of the tangent bundle with two integrable uh, subbundles like that, does that come from a, a, a product, decomposition of the variety into product? Uh, so very interesting result by uh, people of the conference, Stefan Druel, Andrea Sering, and uh, Brunella Pereira Tuzet. But uh, it's hard to see how this extra condition and determinant could help to prove this. And in fact, the proof, the argument given by Bogomolov is the following. I copied directly from, from the paper. He says, there exists a linear connection on M for which E and F are parallel and this implies the decomposition of M into product. Now, I have difficulties to understand that. The connection cannot be holomorphic because that would imply that uh, all, for instance, all chain numbers of M are zero, which is certainly not the case in, uh, in general. On the other hand, if we just ask for a C-infinity connection, this is basically a trivial statement. We can take a a connection on E, a connection on F, I just take the direct sum, and uh, I don't see how this can help to have this uh, composition to products. So I'm, I may certainly be, me, be missing something, but I don't think the proof is, uh, is correct. Anyway, uh, soon afterwards, I mean, in 1977, uh, 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 Yahoo announces this proof of the Kalebi conjecture, and the proof appears in, with all the details in 1978. Uh, we, I will explain below that the decomposition theorem is a direct consequence of, uh, of this theorem, plus some basic results in, uh, in differential geometry. Uh, I think that this became soon well known from among differential geometers much less among uh, algebraic geometers. Uh, for some reason, nobody cared to, to write it down explicitly. Um, now let me explain a little bit my personal motivation and why I, uh, I wrote a detailed version uh, a few years later. Well, what happened is that in uh, 1978, uh, Bogomolov published another paper, this is called Hamiltonian Keller Manifolds, where he claims that, in fact, polymorphic symplectic manifolds do not exist in dimension greater than two. Irreducible, I should say, you have always products of uh, K3 surfaces. Uh, 
uh, of course, we know now that this is, this is wrong. And the error is very is sort of difficult to, to understand. I mean, it does an, an algebraic manipulation with, uh, with two with forms, with holomorphic forms. And at some point, he passes, he moves from one line to the, to the next. And I do not understand what was going on. And I think this is where, where the mistake lies. So, uh, in 1982, in fact, uh, Fujiki constructed a, a counterexample in dimension four. I realized pretty soon that uh, the counterexample could be, in fact, uh, done in any dimension. And this is uh, I mean, well known by now, this is a Hilbert scheme of, uh, of points on a gas free surface. But, I mean, at that time, this was uh, sort of uh, not known. And I realized also that these uh, manifolds are very interesting and very particular properties. So I started studying them and, and found quite, I think, interesting uh, results. And I gave a talk at Harvard beginning of 83. Uh, Phil Griffiths uh, was, was at the, of course, in the audience. I was, uh, we were actually friends at, at the time. And uh, he was an influential editor of the Journal of Differential Geometry. So he suggested that I submit the, my paper there and he insisted that uh, the JDG was looking for papers with a survey aspect. So I, it would be good if I could do some general remarks on uh, many faults with uh, trivial version class. And this is why I wrote a detailed proof of the, of the theory. So in the rest of the talk, let me uh, explain how the theorem follows from the from the Calabi conjecture. Uh, I will start with some uh, very elementary facts in uh, differential geometry. And again, I apologize for those who, who know this very well. Uh, so let me recall that a basic uh, uh, feature of uh, Riemannian manifold is uh, what is called the parallel transport. Uh, on a Riemannian manifold, if you have two, a path from a point to another one, there is a canonical way to transport uh, vectors from one point to the other. So we have, in fact, an isom canonical isomorphism along this path uh, from uh, tangent space of, uh, at P to the tangent space of M at Q. Uh, she's because you have the levi civita connection, which gives a, a linear differential equation. And so if you, you can follow your vector uh, along, the, along the path. And you have the usual composition formula, which implies that if you restrict to loops at P, for instance, a given point P, you get a map into the uh, orthogonal group of uh, TPM, and this will be a, a group. This, the image will be a subgroup of, uh, of the orthogonal group. And this is called the holonomy group or holonomy subgroup at P. Uh, it's turned out, not trivial, but it's a, it's a theorem, that it's a closed subgroup of the orthogonal group of TP of M. In particular, it's a compact uh, Lie group. <coughs> um, okay. This is a very important invariant of uh, Riemannian manifold for the following reason. Uh, of course, we, if, since we have an isomorphism from tangent space to the other, uh, we can extend it to any tensor. Uh, so we say a tensor field is parallel if uh, the, for whatever path we choose from P to Q, we always get, uh, and as we, if you apply, if we take the value of the tensor field at P and we transport it parallelly along the path, we get the value of the, of the field at Q. Now, uh, a tautological but very useful principle is called the holonomy principle. It says that if you take evaluation at P, gives you a bijective correspondence between parallel tensor fields on one hand and tensors on one at one point, which are invariant under the holonomy. 
uh, is pretty clear. If you uh, parallel tensor field and uh, you go around the loop, by definition, we, you will find the same uh, tensor at P, which means that your tensor must be invariant under all anomaly. And conversely, if you have a tensor, you extend it by choosing a path from P to Q, like this. And uh, so you can transport your, uh, your tensor and define the value of, your, uh, of a tensor field at Q as uh, this transported value. And it will, it will not depend on the path you chose because of the invariance and the holonomy. So that's, as I said, tautological, but very useful. Let me give some examples. Here it is. Uh, so I will uh, restrict to uh, examples in the case I'm interested in. We complex manifold. So we assume that we have a complex structure, which given by an endomorphism of a tangent bundle of square minus one. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> to say that uh, the metric is scalar with respect to this uh, complex structure is equivalent to say that uh, J is parallel, it's a parallel tensor field. That's a very nice definition actually of, uh, of scalar manifold. I mean, the, the one I prefer, it's uh, much more geometric than saying that uh, a differential of a, of a two form is, uh, is zero. And uh, that's the geometric version of, uh, of scalarness. And now, but in, in view of the economy principle, uh, to say that the tensor field is parallel means that the holonomy subgroup must restrict, I mean, it's equivalent to saying that the holonomy subgroup respects this, uh, this complex structure, which, mean, which means that uh, the holonomy subgroup is actually contained in the unitary subgroup of TP of M. Uh, second example, what does it mean that G is Ricci flat? Well, I didn't give the definition, it's time to give it. It's uh, the Ricci curvature for a Keller manifold is actually the curvature of the canonical bundle with the metric induced by the uh, original metric G. So uh, to say that this is zero means to say that this, this line bundle is flat. It means it's equivalent to say that uh, the HP is contained in the special unitary uh, group of TP of M. It means that the tensor which corresponds to, to this is a determinant, and uh, the determinant must be a parallel tensor. Third example, which will be of interest for us, this is about the symplectic group. So uh, this is a compact version of a symplectic group, SPR. And there, is, there are two ways to, to define it. This, is, this, is, this will be in, in any way inside uh, uh, acting on a real vector space of uh, 4R dimensions, but you can view it instead inside of uh, GR, GL, C to, to the 2R, a complex vector space of dimension 2R. And then this is the intersection of the symplectic, complex symplectic group, the group which respects a skew-symmetric C bilinear to uh, form, and the unitary group, U 2R. Another definition, it, you can see that inside the linear group of H to the R, so vector space of dimension r over the quaternions and in this case it's just a unitary group over the quaternions when you translate this in terms using the holonomy principle it gives in fact two properties to say that hp is contained in this sympathetic group if we take this uh, definition here well we already have a color well I should have said, this means that we have already a, a Keller manifold, we are inside U of 2R, and this part here means that the holonomy must preserve uh, a, a, a C bilinear skew uh, symmetry to form. This is translated by the fact that there exists a parallel holomorphic symplectic to form on M. The second uh, definition of the symplectic group 
tells us that uh, we are now in the uh, unitary group over the quaternions. This means that we have a quaternionic structure on TP of n, and this is given by, if you prefer, by three complex structure, i, j, k, which are parallel and which behave like uh, they do like in the multiplication of quaternions, i, j is k, etc. So they give uh, an action of edge of uh, the tangent model to n. This is called uh, hypercolor because we have uh, at least three uh, color structure. In fact, we have a complex sphere uh, of uh, color structures, and the, the term hypercolor. Okay, so that's just example. But yeah, a remarkable fact of uh, differential geometry is that uh, despite the fact that we have the definition of the holonomy group is, uh, is very general, there are very, actually very few possibilities. And this is due to two theorems of uh, De Ram and uh, Berger. So for simplicity, let me assume that M is compact and simply connected. Uh, this can be extended, but uh, let's stick to this, uh, this case. Uh, first of all, the Durham theorem tells us that if the holonomy representation is reducible, so uh, we have a decomposition <coughs> of TP of M uh, uh, stable under the holonomy, this corresponds to a decomposition as a, of M as a product of MI, where each factor will come from uh, the, the tangent space of this particular tangent, uh, yes, tangent space as a uh, coordinate corresponding to, to I of uh, this uh, variety MI. So, uh, And the holonomy groups is just a product of the holonomy of the irreducible factors. So this completely reduces the uh, study of the holonomy to the study of uh, irreducible manifolds, those with an irreducible holonomy representation. And then we have another very remarkable theorem of Berger. In fact, in fact, uh, in fact it was uh, a thesis, a Berger thesis. He gives a complete list of the possible representation. There are not many, I mean, there are maybe seven or eight. Let me again restrict to the case I'm interested in, the case of a Keller manifold. If we have a Keller compact manifold, which, which is not a symmetric space, then uh, there are only three possibilities, which are the one have, we have seen before, the unitary group, the special unitary group, or the symplectic group. Now, let me explain how this implies with our theorem, of course, the, uh, the theorem. Let's start with theorem B. So, uh, we have <clears throat> uh, M is compact color, simply connected and with trivial canonical bundle. And we want to, up to a finite etal cover, we want to split it. Uh, well, by Yahoo theorem, we, uh, we know that M carries a Ricci flat Keller metric. So this means that the holonomy is contained in SU. This implies that the, uh, now we apply the Ram theorem, so we decompose M into uh, corresponding to irreducible representation. And the factors, the, hol the holonomy factors again must be contained in SU which means that they are either SUN or SPR. Here I choose to, uh, the SU2 is the same as SP1, and I choose to, uh, to, to view it as SP1. Okay, so we just have to check uh, that they correspond to what I, I claim in the CRM. Um, so we want to look at holomorphic forms on this variety. There is one more ingredient, which is again well known from uh, to differential geometers, which is called the Bochner principle. 
which is that in a compact killer rigid flat manifold, a holomorphic tensor field is parallel. The converse is, is true and easy. The parallel form, I mean, it's very strong to ask for a tensor to be parallel. So for a form, it implies that it's a, it's a, it's closed and in particular holomorphic. But uh, parallel implies uh, oh, sorry, holomorphic implies parallel. This is uh, quite particular to which flat manifolds. So uh, using this, let's look at, at the possibility for our uh, factors which appear in the product here. If we have a holomy SUN, uh, well, the only invariant of SUN in the standard representation is a determinant. That means that the only form which will appear, only holomorphic form which will appear, uh, will be parallel and will be just a, a form of maximal degree. So uh, uh, we have this um, structure of the, of the algebra of uh, holomorphic forms. Since I assume the dimension is at least three, you see that H two zero is zero, which by standard, by I think, by, I guess, by uh, left uh, theorem, implies that X is projective. I mean, uh, H two is the same as H one H one one, and then uh, we have ample line bundles. So the second case is SPR. Then the only some easy algebra to assume that uh, for SPR acting on C2R, I mean the standard representation, the only uh, invariant forms are the powers of the symplectic form. And this gives you the statement about the uh, holomorphic forms on a symplectic manifold. So this gives this proof of theorem B. For uh, theorem A, we start from M compact Keller. Uh, this is for theorem A now. Uh, M compact Keller, again, Ricci flat, thanks to, uh, to Yahoo theorem. Now we have the fact, uh, a result of uh, Chigger Gromal, which tells you that under this hypothesis, in fact, it's uh, it's sufficient that the Ricci curvature is non negative. But it's even better if it's zero. Uh, as there is an isometric isomorphism of the universal cover of M, M Tweedle, with C, the standard uh, affine space, CK, times X, with X compact and simply connected. Uh, thus, M is a quotient by it, uh, of its uh, universal cover, CK times X, by a discrete group gamma. And the point is that this decomposition is canonical. Uh, this comes from Shiger Grammar, that comes also of Yahweh CRM. This corresponds to the uh, decomposition of, uh, according to holonomy. So gamma is uh, act separately on CK and X. Now, uh, the claim is that out X is finite. Uh, remember, this is isometric. I should say this is not only holomorphic uh, automorphism that would be false, but it's a, what is true is that uh, the group of uh, holomorphic automorphism is discrete. You need an argument here, uh, again, using Boschmir principle. Uh, if not, there would be a, a tangent a non-zero holomorphic tangent vector field, and this is uh, impossible by, uh, by again, by Bochner uh, principle. So, uh, so it is discrete, and since it's also contained in the group of isometries, which is compact, it's, it's finite. Therefore, uh, we can pick a finite index subgroup, gamma prime of gamma, which acts trivially on X. That's the first step. Now, this gamma prime acts only on CK, and here we use the very classical Biberbach theorem, which says that there exists another subgroup, gamma second of gamma prime, again a finite index, which acts by translation. Now we are essentially done because uh, we have a, a finite cover. Of, uh, of M by CK times X mod this uh, 
gamma double prime, but this is just CK, but gamma double prime times X, gamma double prime at by translation, the question is compact, so it is a complex torus. And so this gives us the uh, theorem. And I think uh, that's it. That's the end of the, of the talk. Thank you.